I just feel the Lord saying that this period of prayer and fasting is important because we are ushering in an era of revival realities in our lives. And I felt him say that Generation Alpha, who are our youngest, they'll be a generation like no other because they will not have known anything different than living in the realities of revival. They'll be the ones known for living in the wilds of God. And we're all going to be living in those wilds, but this generation will have known no other. And yes, conflicts, yes, persecutions, yes, may, they may be our reality also. But don't you see that all of, in all of it, great revival, great opportunity. And I felt the Lord say, not the stuff to dream of, not the stuff to wait for, not the stuff to be hoping for, but the reality of our lives happening day by day. And I felt this morning, let our response be, let the purified ones, let the courageous ones, let the brave ones, let the lovers of Jesus step into this now and say, yes, Lord, this will be our revival reality today. And some of you need to start asking the Lord, what does that look like for us in our day to day? But I felt the excitement of the Lord to say no more waiting, no more tarrying, no more delay, but we step into an era now of revival reality. Amen. Let's just pray for that just one moment. Let's just press in in the spirit. Maybe you can pray in the spirit. Father, we want to thank you that you are alive, that you are a speaking God, that you are the same yesterday, today and forevermore. Thank you that you are doing something new, Father God, something fresh. And we declare this is a season of release. This is a season of revival. And so we step into it in Jesus' name. Maybe physically you want to take just what I know you're in rows, but just take one step just ahead as a, as a way of saying, Lord, I'm stepping into this for myself, in my marriage, for my family, for our children, for our church, in our city. We want to step into this revival culture. We want to know what it is to walk in the fear of the Lord, to love you, to serve you, to give our whole lives for you, Jesus. And so, Father, we welcome you and we thank you for what you are clearly speaking to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Put your hand on your heart. And just say this with me. Lord, send revival. Begin with me. Come on, say it again. Lord, send revival. Begin with me. Revive my heart. We're going to sing one more chorus as a response to that in a minute. But let me just read this to you. This impacted me this week. Deuteronomy 10 verse 12. And now, church, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. Fear the Lord, walk in obedience, rest in His love, serve Him with your whole heart and soul and observe His commands. What, a, what an era to be alive in right now. He's moving, He's coming, your life really matters. And so say it again, Lord, I'm here. Use me, send me. In Jesus' name, go for it, Beth. We normally do this after somebody has preached and I will be sharing God's word with us in a moment. But I, I just feel the Lord saying, right now I'm here. He's here. And I just feel to have an altar call for anybody that says, I will exalt you. Whatever the chaos that has existed in the last season in your life, right now there is an invitation. The Lord's saying, 
I am moving and you are important in what I'm doing, respond to me and I'll fill you with my spirit. I'll bring alignment where there's been disorder and chaos into your relationship with me, into your marriage, into your singleness. I'll restore it all in a moment if you would respond. And so consider this an altar right now. And as we sing, I want you to come and we're going to pray. We're not going to take a huge amount of time, but I just feel the Lord saying, do it now. Don't stick to your program. Do it now. I'm going to touch people in a very significant way. Chains are going to come off you. You're going to have a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the chaos and the storm that you've been through is going to cease from today. Come on, fill up right to the sides, right to the sides. Uh, uh, you can look up at me for a moment. I won't be able to lay hands on everybody right now, but the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is here. And I, I hear the Lord saying, there's been a lot of chaos in many people's lives. It's a sign of the times. It's not just your fault. It's a sign of the time. There is an increase of wickedness in the world. And many of us have been involved in warfare against our personal life, our relationships. Even this church family has experienced a, a warfare against it. it. Jesus told us we are in a battle. The kingdom of God advances forcefully. Paul told us our battle is never against people it's against spiritual forces so there's been a lot of chaos there's been misalignment the reason I say it, today everything comes back into alignment and and the way it does is you are my hiding place I will exalt you my Lord your faith is not in anything other than God himself who loves you he called you there are prophecies hanging over your life they have not been taken away they are still there about three weeks ago I was five weeks ago I was going through a real warfare internally and the Lord spoke to me from 1 Timothy 1 18 where Paul said to Timothy remember the prophecies once spoken over you so that you can war with them some of you after today need to write down every prophetic word the Lord has given you and use it as warfare against the enemy. If you don't have any, come to one of us. We'll pray over you. We'll prophesy over you today. But you can also take the Bible full of promises and use the Bible as a way of saying, this is what God's word says over me. So lift up your hands. Father, I decree over every person stood here at the front today, the chaos, the misalignment, the attack of the devil through his evil forces that has come against them, I pray that it be still today. I pray alignment into your life, healing into your emotions where you've been wounded, for your soul to become whole, by the presence of the Holy Spirit, for clarity to come where you've not been able to see clearly. From today, you're gonna to see clearly again. Come on, agree with me over marriages right now that have been under attack. It's because the devil knows the powerhouse you can be in your marriage. So I break every attack of the enemy against marriages today and, play, and pray healing and restoration in Jesus' name. I pray that negative words spoken to each other, wounds, arrows, spears, be pulled out in the name of Jesus. Healing, restoration to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Father, I pray that you grant this house, everybody watching, the wisdom to know how to build on the foundation of Christ. To start speaking words of life. Some of you are going to start writing out promises and putting them up on the wall. Prophecies and putting them up on the wall. And you're going to remind each other, this is who we are. This is what God says. 
let's silence the voice of the enemy today he will not employ my tongue from today I'm going to speak what God says in Jesus name amen amen now your action on this is you're going to speak differently you're going to think differently and those two things are really important you take God's word there was actually three things that God said to me five, eight, eight weeks ago about this he said from David's life David said the rulers sit together and slander me I'm going to meditate on your word your statutes and decrees will be my counselors how many know there's a lot of thoughts the enemy throws and they try and counsel you you don't want to let them counsel you you take God's word and let it counsel you you say I am loved you say every day ordained for me was written in your book before one of them came to me I'm gonna believe what you say you say marriage is supposed to be blessed and healthy and a safe place I'm gonna say that about my marriage you say my kids will serve you because I'm serving you I'm gonna pray it over my kids right now so you start taking God's Word and meditating on it and allowing it to be your counselors and then secondly you're gonna take prophecies and hold them and say Lord you said this about my life and I thank you that the call of God is without repentance no matter what has gone on and then thirdly you're gonna get rooted into intimate love with Jesus put a bit of worship on and just adore him I just love you you're beautiful and he will come so close so quick you'll be surprised that you haven't been doing that for a while his presence is healing it restores it enlarges three very simple keys amen I'm gonna let you go back to your seats hallelujah amen amen hallelujah and father I declare over this house a special protection by God's grace special protection the fire of the Holy Spirit and even as we continue Holy Spirit would you keep washing over us in Jesus name we are believing that we are stepping into a revival culture really appreciate Hannah for what she brought this morning and you know we've been talking about revival and reformation for years uh, but this is the season of prophetic fulfillment and this is a season of release where we're going to step into the fullness of all that God has got for us and so we are grateful that you are here with us at this significant time we were born for such a time as this and whether you've been in this church for years or you're new to the faith and you only gave your life to Christ last week uh, we are all in this together and we are a family and we can contend for the promises of God amen well it's been a it's been an exciting morning so far and I feel really blessed by all that God has been saying and being able to worship together this morning and I just feel it's overflow you know this church family is a praying family and I'm just going to take a moment just to reflect on the last week of our prayer and fasting but I want to say a big thank you to everybody who's been out on weeknights uh, it's not people that don't have jobs it's people that are very busy with families and working um, it's a whole mixture of people, young and old, and we appreciate you being here. And we appreciate this praying family, the ones of you that would love to be here but couldn't be here. We appreciate you praying and fasting from home as well. And all of that, God hears, God sees, and, and we are grateful to you. And we want to encourage you to come on out this week if you haven't been able to or if you didn't remember. Uh, it's not too late to start fasting uh, to come and join us in the place of prayer every weeknight, seven till nine. But it has been a really, really special and significant time. And I think we were really amazed right from the onset just how many people showed up. So on Monday night last week, we had around 50 people. And I was like, whoa, I counted half. And then I thought, wow, you know, that's a lot of people. So probably more than that, Andrew was saying, but that's fine. But it wasn't many weeknights. Okay, so yeah. it might have been more than 50 on the first night um, before over 100 were coming every night. And for a weeknight 
prayer night to have over 100 people in this space praying, listening to God, crying together on their knees, saying, Lord, we want to be set apart for your purposes. Your kingdom come in our lives. Your will be done. It's just such a powerful atmosphere to be in. And so I pray that you can feel a bit of the overflow of that this morning. And we, we are believing that God's going to put a spirit of prayer upon us, that we might be truly a praying people that humble ourselves and seek his face. Uh, so much was coming through the prayer nights, and we've tried to capture as much as we um, can, um, but just a couple of things, and so I'll miss out loads of things maybe that you were sensing, but on the very first night when we gathered together, it was really obvious and clear that God was speaking to us about a new sound being released on the earth, that as we come together, there's a new sound being released, a sound of revival, a sound of reformation, a sound of unity, a sound of humility, and so it was so exciting to kind of catch that sound together and just um, partner with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 14, 8, it says, again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? And just this overwhelming sense on night one that God wants us to sound a clear call because we are in a spiritual battle and we need to leave everything else and pursue only him. Day two, we were looking at a kingdom of priests in Revelation 1, that we are made to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and Father, that we're here to minister before him. And we had such precious time just in God's presence ministering to him. I might just say about that, that the priesthood peace was important because there was a sense of many people don't realize that they can build altars in their home Amen. and be a priest. And they're actually built negative altars and are doing priestly duties in the wrong way. If you build a prayer life and a family altar, it has an influence out there. If I build my altar in front of the television and entertainment, I'm wasting my calling and my authority and not realizing what heaven has for me to do. So a big part of that Tuesday night was, Lord, would you help us to see how powerful our calling is to be able to build altars of prayer and sacrifice and then change the course of history because of it. And one of the phrases that came out was, history belongs to the intercessors. Wow, very good. Standing in the gap, making a difference. Our prayers count. It really matters. Mm. And by praying together, we are bringing transformation first to ourselves Mm. and then to everything and everyone around us. And so uh, it's just such a a privilege to be able to pray with one another. Mm. On day three, um, I had a vision of the UK with um, fires starting all over the UK and the breath of God breathing and these fires turning into wildfires that then went from this nation to other nations and just praying for revival in our nation Mm. uh, and um, in other nations. Mm. Day four, Um, yeah, just a real sense. We might have been battle weary, but since that word weary, um, shuffling and becoming ready, we're going from battle weary to battle ready. And just this whole um, picture is being brought about, you know, people on the battlefield that have been weary and uh, not maybe on their horse, not fully equipped in the armor, suddenly beginning to stand as the sound is released for wars, the sound is released for an advance. And then uh, on Friday, a few different ways it was coming out about it being a groundbreaking season. Mm-hmm. And on uh, Friday night, the youth led so wonderfully. Um, but just as we left, I had a picture of lots of shoots coming out the ground. Mm-hmm. And again, I heard the, the, the phrase, it's groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we think of something really um, loud and strong that breaks the ground, and, and that can happen. But also, when seeds have been planted and watered and the roots go deep enough, the very delicate little plants begin to emerge and I feel that there's been so much seed sown in the last season here at All Nations in our families uh, with by our prayers and right now we, it's groundbreaking yeah. we are emerging and, and it's beautiful what God is doing with us so yeah maybe I've said enough a season of release And we want to be aligned to God's purposes. So please do come and join us this week if you're able as we press into God Mm. to hear even Mm. more. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
And Father, you've spoken so much to us, and we are grateful for that this morning. And now for a few minutes, as we come around your word and we continue this conversation that you've been having, I thank you that it's not something different. It flows with where you've been taking us. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you be the spirit of wisdom and revelation to every person in the room today? In Jesus' name, amen. I, I would just say to us this morning, the importance of understanding, and I've said this in the past, so don't ignore it because I've said it before, but your life is ever so important as part of what God is doing on the earth right now. The enemy spends a lot of time trying to make us think that we are either insignificant or we don't count or it's for somebody else or I'm just going to get busy with what I'm doing. But I want to say to you today, the Heavenly Father had you born into this generation because he has a plan for your life. It's a good place for an amen. That's not even a challenge. It's me saying to you, you are not an accident. You were born by God's heavenly design. He wants you alive. And he plants you into a community and you build within that community and together we hear the Lord and we say yes to his unfolding story. This is why the enemy works really hard to cause a person to doubt the father's goodness, the father's calling, the father's identity over them. Most people struggle with that. Or he will try and distract us with a temporary mindset rather than an eternal one, get you to think temporary. Make money, buy a house, do a holiday, climb the ladder. No, nothing wrong with any of those things. And the Father blesses us with those things, but they actually fit inside of submission to him as king and realizing I have a part to play in his divine story. This over here is not my divine story. It fits in. He'll give me a car when I need one. He'll help me with a house. Every other thing will be added on to me. But actually, the first thing is, seek first the king and his kingdom. So what are you saying? And I think for many of us, there's been a real chaos and confusion where we've got our priorities muddled up. Or we've been a bit distracted. Now, hear me this morning. No judgment. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I just want to call you into your higher purpose and remind you that you were created by God and then birthed into this generation and that there is alignment coming to you today. Last week, I, or two weeks ago, I spoke to us uh, from Matthew 16, who do you say that I am? It was Jesus speaking and he's asking the question, who am I? Who do people say? And then he said, who do you say I am? And we settled this from scripture that he is king. He's king through the past, present, and the future. He's king of the ages, in other words. He's king of heaven. He's, uh, he's king over a spiritual kingdom. So he's king. He's king over a kingdom. And his kingdom has a mission. We could live in that. Like, I belong. I, I, I quite like my British passport. It gets me into places when I travel. I'm sure it would also keep me out of some places if I tried to travel there. But it can be beneficial, having a passport saying, I belong to the United Kingdom. But I'm telling you today, I belong to the Kingdom of God. And that identity will take me places a British passport could never get me to. Do you know you belong to a kingdom with a king over it and you have privileges? And there is a way that his kingdom operates and you belong there, you have an inheritance there, you are provided for, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you, Jesus is interceding on, your right, on the right hand of the Father for you right now. And that there is an inheritance in this kingdom for you. 
You're not just trying to make it through. You are a subject of the kingdom. You're a child of God and the king is watching over you. But if I live muddled and confused and in charge of my own life as a Western valued person, I actually stop the Lord being able to do the things in my life that he wants to do. But the moment I bring alignment and say, no, your kingdom first, your purpose first, my life, your life, my money, your money, my time, your time, my gifts and talents used for your kingdom, the alignment, it goes click, 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 click. He releases heavenly forces, angelic beings to work on my behalf, on your behalf. I'm telling you, because what we're now committed to is not the furtherance of our own well-being on the earth, it's the advance of his kingdom. So last week, uh, two weeks ago, we spoke about being in a kingdom and leaving you with the question, who do you say he is? Is he really king? And I, I, I think it takes sometimes a few days, few weeks, few months wrestling with that. Is he really king and Lord? Or am I still the boss of my own life? And I'm like, I want you to be in charge. I think you do a better job than I can do. Anybody else? And so that was uh, a few weeks ago. Today... I want to give you just a few, I don't have much time because the way the service has gone, so I'll give you what I can, I may not get through everything, I'm going to give you a few ancient principles for that kind of success. So being in his kingdom and seeing that fruitfulness in advance, there are kingdom principles, ancient ones that are often forgotten, that will activate things on your behalf in the kingdom and I want us to go there. I'll give you one reminder from two weeks ago. J.I. Packer said the old gospel was God and his dealings with man. He said the way we've made it today, the new gospel is God and what, man, uh, what God can do for man. So it used to be God and his dealings with us. We were his subjects. In the modern gospel, we've made it well, it's about me. What can you do for me? Our preaching centers on that. Our books have been about that. And the Lord is reordering that right round. And in this house, we love you. I've just said that for the last seven minutes. You're important in God's plan. But I also want to tell you, it's not all about you. It's all about him. His purpose, his kingdom. And you fit inside of that. And you will be happiest in that right order. And so we will unapologetically lift the Lord high. Unapologetically say we are going to give our lives for his purposes on the earth. Unapologetically say if there's a clash of kingdoms, my own way of thinking and his way of thinking, I will bend my way of thinking and push it to one side to order my life according to his way of thinking. Amen. Anybody else? I think you, you I'm a, these are, this is a Pentecostal church. You're allowed to say amen. <laughs> if you felt wild enough, you could stand with a clean handkerchief and wave it. Uh, <laughs> no flying around of germs, but anything else you... Uh, and so I, I've been living a little bit in Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I'm going to speak to you from Acts 4 today. Um, and, and I think I might only get through one or two of the ancient principles. I actually have four, but I think I might only be able to touch one or two of them. Um, but I'd rather not rush it and just give you enough, and you can take that with you. Um, so we're going to be in Acts 4 in a minute, but you know that in Acts 1, the resurrected Jesus has spoken to those that have seen him for 40 days after his death, resurrected, for 40 days, he travels around, not very far, but just starts talking to people about the kingdom of God, which is interesting. The risen king spends 40 days talking to people about the kingdom of God. That's in Acts 1, 2, 3. Um, and then they're told in Acts 1, 8 to wait for the Holy Spirit. And after the Holy Spirit will come, there will be, then there will be his witnesses on behalf of the king and his kingdom He's going to send them, yes, to Jerusalem where they are, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So I, I don't know if you see this picture. The king resurrects from the dead and then says, and now 
I'm speaking to you about my advancing kingdom. I'm going to put my Holy Spirit inside of you. And you are going to advance this kingdom where you are right now. Uh, so you could say Wolverhampton, the West Midlands, the United Kingdom, and to the ends of the earth. You're going to take this advance yourselves. That's what he was saying to them. In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out. They get a fresh boldness. They encounter God. They speak in new tongues. At the end of Peter's message, 3,000 people have given their lives to Christ and entered into this kingdom. And at the end of chapter 2, the church is born. And we spent a lot of time looking at Acts 2, uh, 37, 38, to the end of the chapter, the characteristics of that early group, the, the birthday of the church in Acts 2. Then you get to Acts 3, and Peter and John are on their way to the temple. Imagine this. You know, all that excitement in that few days, filled with the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people saved. In Acts 1, they've been praying and praying and praying. And then in Acts 3, they're on their way to prayer. And as they're on their way to prayer, they see a lame man who's been there for years. So they've seen him before. But today is the day for a miracle. And the short story is Peter prays for him, lifts him up, and he's instantly healed after decades of being crippled. And this causes a major stir because he's, he's a well-known crippled man at the gate called Beautiful. And because he's raised up, he goes jumping and leaping and running and praising God. Peter ends up speaking the gospel again to hundreds of people who start to give their lives to Christ. And by chapter 4 and 5, it's another 5,000 added to their number. I mean, it's crazy, this activity of the Holy Spirit, the advance of the kingdom. But in chapter 4, uh, the beginning of chapter 4, the first 21 verses, they're actually, they've been arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin for doing that miracle, disturbing the peace. And as they come in for 21 verses, the Sanhedrin are trying to figure out what went on, what did you do? And they're saying to them, you must not speak in the name of this man, Jesus, anymore. You're disturbing the peace. And, but Peter has such a boldness on him. Verses 12 and 13, salvation, Peter said, is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And when the Sanhedrin saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It's, it's, I mean, I, I put myself into the shoes of the early church. It wasn't that long ago when they were running. Peter was denying. They were scared. Every disciple left Jesus in the garden. Peter wasn't the only one that betrayed. Everybody betrayed. Everybody said, we don't know him. Everybody left him in his hour of need. And now here they are under the threat of death saying, we can't help but preach in his name. He is our king. We are on his mission. We have been given a commandment. And you choose whether we serve what you're saying or we do what he's saying. I don't know if you understand how radical it is. These are normal people with homes and families and business, businesses and yet they have had an encounter with the King of Kings. They have seen him ascend to heaven. They've been filled by his spirit. And he told them, you are now going to advance my kingdom from here to the ends of the earth. I mean, they've got no money. They've got no clout. There's no famous people. They've probably got no passports. And yet the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying, is going to come on you and you're going to go to the ends of the earth. And it begins with a bang. I want to say this to us as a church family, and I don't say this to try and hype you up. I've been here a while. 1992, I joined All Nations as a youth pastor uh, in the other building next door. So I've, I've been around a while. I've seen a few things. And you should say, you're too young to have been around that long. <laughs> you, you only look about 25. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. That was uh, I do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and so I don't say this as hype, but I will say it to you as a church family, and even have a look around you this morning, after all that we've been through, the grace of God upon us, his kindness towards us. We've been living with prophetic promises, and over the years, 
Some of them we have come to see. They've, they've happened. We, we declared we would build land. We have. Uh, take land, build our building. God's been kind to us. Uh, we've paid all our bills. Since, since, since all my years here, we've been through major times of how are we going to do that. I'm looking at Angela, one of our trustees here. I think Israel's here as well. And Brother Toye, they're trustees. They help govern what we're doing behind the scenes in terms of as a charity. And we've had many conversations over the last 20 years. Of, I don't know how we'll do that. I don't know how we're going to do that. And then we do that. <laughs> Hudson Taylor used to say, he said, God's work is impossible, then it's difficult, and then it's done. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> God's work is impossible, difficult, done. And we're a faith people, but I just want to say to you, God's in the house. He's with us. And with all of that wisdom and experience, I am absolutely convinced. Many of you know Esther and I have been on sabbatical for three months. And people had all kinds of thoughts. What are they going to do when they come back? Um, uh, have they got a new vision? Um, some people thought, he's probably going to leave. Uh, I want to tell you, we got so excited about this house, the prophecies over this house, the calling of God over this house. I don't have a new vision, but I have a renewed vision. And I am more excited than ever about the season that we are in and everything God has been saying, it feels like it's confirmed in me. Like, Lord, it's been a rough few years. It, it's rough on the heart. It's rough on relationships. But you are faithful. I say all of that to say, I believe revival is just around the corner. Not as hype, but as a... You, you see, I preach the scriptures to you. I exalt the Lord before you. I want to be balanced in what we bring, weighted in. But I have a a burning or a bubbling in my blood and in my bones that I think the next three months, we're just getting a few things in order. And from 2025, this house will run in a way that we've never run before. Amen. A season of acceleration. Uh, I found myself one of the prayer meetings kind of just repet repetitive phrase, expansion on all fronts. I couldn't stop saying it, expansion on all fronts, expansion on all fronts. And I felt the Lord saying, that's my will for you, and it's coming. So I want to say to you, the Lord's with us, but we've got to be involved in his kingdom purpose, not our own. Do what he calls us to do. I would love to read the rest of this chapter. I'm not going to get there. I want you to read it. I want you to read Acts chapter 4 and see the way that it walks through these you can read this at home later today. Here's my ancient principles of what I see in that chapter. So I'll try and give you at least one. The first one is that these disciples, as you read the chapter, you realize they were consecrated. Uh, the word consecrated is old. So let's use another one. They were set apart. They were holy unto the Lord. Could use another one. They were fully surrendered to God. It, it's a very powerful dynamic that for God to be able to use you like he wants to, you have to come into a place of full surrender. That means selfish ambition dies. The desires for myself die. The, the desire for him and his kingdom grows. One of the things that we've done again and again while we've been on sabbatical is come to the conclusion and pray it to the Lord and, and sometimes on our knees just to say, Lord, we surrender all to you. And I see this in this chapter when, when Peter says to the Sanhedrin, uh, they're threatening them with prison or death. And that's, that's a big deal because they killed your boss. <laughs> So it's not an empty threat. And they're saying, you stop speaking in that name. You stop being a kingdom man. You stop being a kingdom woman. And Peter says, well, you decide whether we obey God or you. As for me, I can't help but speak about that which I have seen and heard. That's a consecrated life. One that is no longer afraid to die to themselves, die to their ambition, 
Maybe when he was a fisherman, he had ideas about what he wanted to achieve, how much money, when he would retire. But encountering a king and his kingdom, he laid them all down and says, King Jesus, whatever you want, whenever you want it. I have a friend who says, your will, in your ways, and in your timing. Isn't that beautiful? I believe God wants that from us. And today, as a church family, if this is the only ancient principle for success I get to give you, I would say coming to the point of surrender is the most freeing way to live. And yet, many of you are born again. I get that. But I actually think we can be born again and then we hold on to certain things. Lord, you can't touch this. Lord, you can't challenge me on that. And yet the Lord is saying, no, no, no. Surrender means surrender. It's full yielded life. Paul put it like this in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true, proper worship. That's powerful. I encourage you to offer or urge you, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I, I say to you today, and I see it happening, there is a breed of Christian disciple arising who are living that way. Uh, Andrew has said this to me many times in the last few weeks, the parable of Jesus where he, Jesus tells a parable, a man finds a treasure in a field, and in his joy, he goes away, sells everything he has uh, to buy the treasure in the field. The, the treasure in the field is the kingdom of God. He was telling them a parable about the kingdom, the king and his dominion. I, I, I really don't have time to tell you the other ones. Uh, I don't have time to preach them, but I see prayer there. I see consecration. I see prayer. I see Christ-likeness. In other words, their anger has been replaced with patience and love. Their accusation with intercession, they're becoming like Jesus. Selfish ambition is gone. They share property and goods with one another. I, and fourthly, I see a common unity, community there. Uh, this is like, it, it so pains me that in the Western church, People don't really understand community. It's the giving of our lives one for another. It's walking with each other in the difficult times. Anybody understand? Anybody want that amongst us? Like, um, most of my ministry life, the Lord's been ever so kind that we've seen tremendous growth and fruitfulness. I don't know why he does it, but he keeps opening up doors, looking after us, opening things up. But I've also noticed sometimes when you get in the last five years, there's been a pruning time. In the pruning time is when you find out who your friends really are. You don't really know who your friends are when everything's going well. Anybody with me? You find out who your friends are when you are stripped, you've got nothing, you can't give them anything, and it looks like, like Job, everything's against you. And maybe even the Lord has raised his hand against you for Job. And then you find out who's your friend, who will stick closer than a brother or a sister. And you've been through this. You've been through it in your marriages. You've been through it with friends that you thought were your friends and you got surprised that they weren't there anymore. No judgment against anybody. Everybody's going to make the choices that they feel are right. The reason I say it is, with everything in me, I want this house to become a true collection of ecclesias, churches, home churches, where unity, common unity, 
laying down our lives, the sharing of our lives, our time, our energy, our gifts, our talents, even our finances, starts to happen in an incredible way. Can the Lord do that? Could, could he have a consecrated people here? Could he have a praying people here? Do you think he could raise up those who live in community, so in, un, in, in relationship with one another? And could we become more like Jesus every day? More forgiving, less selfish ambition, and more about what the king wants. I can't ask you to respond to all of that, but I'm going to go back to the first one and just ask you, as, as I bring this to a close, and I think you owe me a well done for finishing on time, because I, I am so full this morning. Um, I, I felt the Lord saying to me, show me how a person become, can become a force of nature. You know, Paul was a force of nature. He just turned the world upside down because he was consecrated, full of the Holy Spirit, because he prayed, and because he was in unity with others that he traveled with and to the apostles in Jerusalem, and because he was becoming more like Jesus. He became unstoppable, and the kingdom broke out through him. And then the Lord showed me, Andrew, come, and Esther, maybe. Um, I'll come down a bit if you like. Um, so if I become that, consecrated, prayerful, more and more like Jesus, and then living in unity with, in my marriage first, um, this is our son, no he's not. Um, <laughs> in, in my marriage first, now I might be a force of nature in terms of bringing kingdom advance, but if I get this in my marriage and she's that way and I'm that way and we are one, we can do more for the kingdom. One can put a thousand to flight. Two can put 10,000. 10, it's crazy. You would think 2,000. What if then we became friends and Andrew was consecrated. He was living, surrendered to Christ. He has a meaningful prayer life. He's becoming more like Jesus, and now he's in unity with me. Come on, Marcia. And then how, how about if Andrew and Marcia, I'm not going to get you all up here, <laughs> but that really is the point. What if all of us become consecrated, a praying people who become more like Jesus and stay in unity together? We can turn the tide in a nation and in the nations. In one of the prayer meetings this week, I felt the Lord saying, nations hang in the balance. You can have that, or you can just do a church service on a Sunday, run after our goals, and hopefully there's good worship and a good... But I'm like, I'll have the revival piece. I, I, what a heritage we pass on to our children that way. So I'm going to ask you to respond to the consecration piece. Just think about it, and it might be that today starts a journey. If you're saying, yes, Lord... I want to be fully surrendered. Take me on the journey of knowing what that means. And just stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you as we close.